This okay. is Songwriters Room, and I'm your host, Tomoko. Today's guest is Wycliffe Gordon. Now, where can I start? Wycliffe is the best, not one of the best, I'm saying the best trombonist in the world. He's mm -hmm. received 2020 Jazz Journalist Association Trombonist of the Year Award, but actually he's received it for 13 years. Downbeat Magazine has given him Best Trombone Award almost every year. He's received Louis Award by the Louis Armstrong House Museum, International Trombone Association Award, ASCAP Foundation Vanguard Award, and many, many more. He is a veteran member of the Winter Marsalis Septet from 1989 to 95, and an original member of Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra from 1995 to 2000. His performance experience includes work with the great Dizzy Gillespie, Lionel Hampton, Winton Marsalis, of course, Arturo Sandoval, Shirley Horn, David Sanborn, Paul Simon, Diane Reeves, Tommy Flanagan, Joe Henderson, Annette Cohen, Ricky Skaggs, Natalie Merchant, Renee Marie, Eric Reed, and Brownford Marsalis, just to name a few. He's appeared on numerous TV shows such as Grammy Awards with Winter Marsalis and the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, Twinging with Duke on PBS, Uptown Blues Ellington at 100 Live from Lincoln Center, Ken Burns Documentary Jazz, a Carnegie Hall Christmas concert live from Lincoln Center, the Juilliard School at 100 Years, Journey with Jazz at Lincoln Center on BET and more. Wycliffe is also a dedicated educator and taught many students from elementary schools to universities all over the world, including the Juilliard School, Manhattan School of Music, Augusta University, Arizona State University, Michigan State University, Temple University, James Morrison Academy, and many more. In 2007, the city of Augusta, Georgia, declared August 17 as Wycliffe Gordon Day. He is a musician endorsed by Yamaha and has his own line of Wycliffe Gordon Pro Signature Mouthpieces by Pickett Brass. And those are just a tip of the iceberg of his tremendous lifetime of work. And check this, he is not only the best trombonist in the world, but also plays mind-boggling 23 freaking instruments. <laughs> and he can scare his ass off, okay? Wycliffe has released total 20 solo CDs and eight co-leader CDs. Today, two lucky winners will receive his latest CD, Wycliffe Gordon as his international all-stars, I Give You Love. When you sign up for my email list at tomokomusic.com and message me and tell me what you liked about the show. So I must say, this is going to be a master class, a quick crash course. So get a pen and paper, people. Can I get a whoop, whoop? Whoop, whoop. <laughs> so ladies and gents, please welcome the incomparable Wycliffe Gooder! <laughs> Yay! Yes. Thank Good you to see you, me. Wycliffe. Thank you for being on the show. Yeah, it's been a long time. Good to see you too, Tomoko. Yes. You know, there are very few musicians that when we hear them, you know exactly who it is in the first 10 seconds, like Mm -hmm. Georgie Benson's guitar, Winton Marsalis trumpet, Marcus Miller's bass, Stevie Wonder's mm -hmm. harmonica, etc. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you too got such a signature sound that I can mm -hmm. tell you, I can tell right away that's Wycliffe. <laughs> and also, it's a very unique tone, and I don't know how you do it, but it almost sounds like a person talking, mm -hmm. and it's weirdly so awesome. Like, I, I can't put it into words. So could you please give us a little something, something like 50 seconds, please? Sure. Um, <laughs> normally, I would probably do that with um, a plunger. But I, I'll say before I play, 
um, mm-hmm. that I always, I've always been influenced by singers and the number one, my greatest influence being Louis Armstrong. When you talk about people with a recognizable sound, whether they're playing or singing or speaking, that was one thing that I always thought was important. And I'm glad to have come up. Uh, when I started listening to jazz, he was one of the first people that I got a chance to hear. And it's like, wow, you know, you may get caught up in the fidelity of the recording, but that means absolutely nothing. A great sound is a great sound, an individual well, sound. Well, let me, since you mentioned him, let me tell you, uh, your singing voice is very unique too, but naturally like Southern deep, but fuzzy and sweet at the same time. Mm-hmm. Your vocals is like to me, Louis Armstrong of our generation. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's a, so, that's a great compliment. I would say I'm heavily influenced mm-hmm. um, by Louis Armstrong and always moved by his music so naturally. A matter of fact, he influenced uh, quite a few vocals, many that came after him, whether they sound like him or not, Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra, Billy mm. Holiday. Mm. And I'm not saying it. All, all of these musicians say it. He influenced, he had a great influence on a lot of, you know, Western culture sure. that went past jazz music, but also pop music. Anyway, I'll play something that's kind of um, improvised. Okay. And you'll see most of my horn. But I'll step back for a second. You just spoke to our hearts. <laughs> and also, your scat is so pleasant to my ear. So if we have enough time mm-hmm. later, i like to get some tips on scatting. But we got sure. a lot to cover. So if we don't got enough time, maybe you can teach me privately later. <laughs> yeah, we, we can work that out. Yay. So, so listen, Wycliffe, I had an honor to share the stage with you in my New York days. Mm-hmm. And you also generously rendered your talent on my song of New York anthem called Mercy, Joy, and the City. And, yes. and also No Geisha, which I'm going to re-release on Spotify and other platforms later this year. Mm-hmm. And remember, you even hired me to do a makeover your office in Harlem at the time. Yes, yes. <laughs> and what I learned when I was around you is that music is the air you breathe. That's Mm -hmm. all you think about. If you're not playing, you'll be humming or whatever all day. And I thought, if I was your wife, I would be jealous because you're absolutely married to music. That's that's what it is. So (laughs) let me ask you, what is music to you? Well, music, I mean, mean, you you, kind of said it all. To me, it's like... um, it's like breathing. When I wake up in the morning, music almost starts to happen immediately. I'm always, I'm humming something, whether it's something I'm, I just hear in the morning, it may be a song, it may just be something that's kind of new. I was driving just two days ago, and I was like, boom, 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 you know what? Then I took my phone out. I said, "Hi, right, wait a minute. So I just sang it into my phone. And just last night, right. I notated it. And it's over a, a kind of a familiar chord sequence, uh, one, six, two, five. And I said, well, you know, there's another song. So I never take for granted when music will come. Sometimes it's when I'm driving. I could be riding on a bus. But if, if even if I don't, well, now I have a phone. Used to be I had to write it on paper, but now I can just record it in the phone and go back to it. And sometimes it's not a full song. Sometimes it's just ideas. Like if I'm working on a phrase, mm-hmm. 
And if I if that's kind of swirling around in my head, I pick up my phone and I record it and I say, you know what, I'm gonna write that down later because I have these things that I call sometimes they just call them phrases. So music to me is just it's a major um part of my life or my existence. Mm -hmm. It's not the only thing I do. I do enjoy doing other things, but <laughs> of um, like Duke Ellington said, music is my mistress, and she plays second fiddle to none. So you know, <laughs> I have had, I've been married a, a couple of times, but music has always been um, my wife. The music is, you know, was there before the music will be here um, after. And I'm, I feel very blessed that I get to, you know, make a living doing what I love to do. So it's not like work. You know, sometimes no. people say, oh, I, man, I got to get up and go to this job today. Well, me, let's see, I get to teach. Okay, I have to be around other people. But I get to play, I get to write, I get to compose, I get to, you know, produce to do something in music. I don't ever want to stop. You know, people ask me when I would retire. I'm like, from this? When I stop breathing? So that's what music is to me. It's an, it's an essential part of my being and my existence. Indeed. I know you can play anything, any genres, but talking about jazz now, now to me, jazz as a style of music is on a whole another level out of all other genres because in the very intricate theory, there is a rule, but also ultimate freedom of improvisation at the same time. So mm -hmm. you have to be mature knowing who you are and how to express fearlessly. It's mm -hmm. like life itself. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, what does jazz mean to you? Well, jazz is, what jazz means to me is, uh, I mean, it's a lot. You have so many, like in classical music, you have four, basically we studied four periods of classical music that were separated by like centuries. Jazz, the, the development of jazz separated in decades and you know from the early ragtime on up through big band and on up through beyond to the avant-garde jazz progressed very quickly um in the united states so there are many different styles of jazz but jazz to me is the opportunity to for one to be individual but also to be a part of a team at the same time so you said something about you know, knowing the rules and breaking the rules. It's, um, I don't know if it's breaking the rules. Jazz just gives you the freedom. It's true freedom of speech when you get a chance to improvise. Now, you do have to learn the language. I, yep. you know, barely yep. speak English good, so I've learned a few words in Japanese, but I couldn't have a conversation with you in Japanese. So if I'm going to play mm. jazz, I, I, I'd have the things that's going to help me to understand the music. Like, what does a C minor 7 mean? Well, this is the sound. So the thing is, once you learn the mechanics or the rules, you don't have to break the rules, but you can be flexible in the rules because they, they call it that part that we do called improvisation. It's taken from the word improve. So to improve mm. upon a melody would be something simple like, um, if I was playing Happy Birthday, um, but if we're going to improve upon that melody, we may change it up and improvise over it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so we get the chance to, we have the freedom to participate inside of the rules, but the freedom to tell our stories based on those rules or chord right. changes or structure. So jazz is, um, I think it's the greatest example in music where you learn the structure and then if you're playing, whether it's a big band or a small group, the collective improvisation, meaning 
that, yeah, you have a set of chord changes, but the bass player is going to approach it one way. The piano player is going to approach it another way. Uh, um, uh, one way, as long as you all are listening to each other, is where we all have to listen and make music spontaneously at the same time. And you can play it 10 different times and it never be the same, but it's the same song. And, and that's the great thing to me about, you know, jazz, that mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. Improve. I will remember that. Had your father was a musician too? Yes, uh, my late father, he played, he played and studied classical music and he also played in church. So mm -hmm. he didn't really get into jazz until later. I don't mm -hmm. know that he ever played jazz, but when I was working with uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center, up until 2000, he could turn the radio on and he could hear some of the programs because he still lived in Waynesboro, Georgia, where I was born. But he could hear me playing on the radio or hear performance that I was a part of. So I think he appreciated that he really, really, really loved classical music. So you'd hear Beethoven and mm. Mozart and Schumann. And, and, and that's kind of, he, he really revered that. But he was a great lover of music. And outside of teaching music and practicing classical music, he played in the church. So I got a chance to hear a lot of um, gospel music. And I do thank my father for giving us that exposure to music. Period. I remember you told me you were 17 years old when Wynton Marsalis picked you to join his band, and that was it. Now, I was 19 or 20, and I was, it was probably about 21 when I got a chance to go and meet him. And maybe uh, I started playing with him in 1989. I was born in 1967, so I was 22 years old. Right after my 22nd birthday, I called him. Seven, eight days later, I meet with his band in Charleston, South Carolina at the Spoleto Festival. June 6th was the gig, and mm. that was a, supposed to be a temporary a temporary job mm. that turned into my career. So mm -hmm. what started out as me going to play with him for the summer, it turned into my, my career as a professional performing jazz musician. That skyrocketed from there, your, your career, would you say? Oh, well, yeah. I was out, we were down in Aruba, and... Eric Reed was uh, who was filling in on piano from for Marcus Roberts at the time wanted to talk about considering going to another college. I don't think he was happy where he was. And mm -hmm. Winston said, "I don't want to school for a year. Talk to Wycliffe." And I said, "Well, I don't know. I'm thinking about transferring schools myself." And Winston then said, "Well, I thought everything was cool with you where you were." I said, "Well, you know, it's, it's okay." But his dad had just left a, a university. Virginia Commonwealth University in, um, in Virginia and they had gone to teach at the um, University of New Orleans. And I always wanted to live in New Orleans. But Winton then said, well, you know, do you want to stay out of here for a while and play on the road? And I thought about it for all of about 10 seconds. I said, yes. And that yes for my temporary summer gig went on to the, for the rest of that um, year. And then, you know, by January, I went and said, well, want to stay out and play i'm like uh yeah and it was one of the greatest um learning experiences mm. then that whole time i was with the uh septet i was the seventh member to join and then he started touring under the name the name of the winter marsala septet and um it, it was just um you know wonderful i got a chance to see the world and i got a chance to learn to play i got a chance to meet with many great musicians you know, instrumentalists and vocalists, and I got a chance to see many great things. So a lot of tragic things as well, but when students ask me, well, how do you make it? I think you have to be prepared, and if you're doing something that you really love to do, the door will be open to you, or when your time comes, you just want to be prepared for it. That's so right. there's no one formula, but right. that's how it happened for me, and, um, you know, like I said, I'm very blessed to have had that opportunity, but I yes. want to keep it. Yes, but you've been constantly performing and always booked like you're two years ahead. But now I'm assuming that it's all canceled in the meantime. So how have you shifted in terms of your project and work? I love being home. I, okay. I have not I've been on the road for 30 years. This is the most I've been home in 30 years. And even though it's through the unfortunate thing, you know, with COVID, we have to make music differently. We have to teach Differently, we can't go back into the classroom with social distancing. So, as a jazz musician and a creative person, we're always riddled with how to improvise, 
how to make things better. So I'd always talked about coming home and being home, but you know, as long as I had work, I'm, I was good. The first month canceled, then two, then four. So the rest of the year is canceled. And I remember saying, I said, you know what? I'm, people would call me and say, man, you must have cabin fever from being at home and not going on the road. I said, no. <laughs> I said, I actually enjoy being at home. I sleep in the same bed every night. Yeah. I, I get to ride my motorcycle. I haven't packed a suitcase since <laughs> March. And, you know, right. and, and I, I love performing and doing all of that, but I find also that I like myself. So right. you know, being, in the, being, being at home is not such a bad thing. And, yeah, the gigs have canceled, and we have to figure out ways to continue to earn an income. But as I always tell my students, you want to maybe have more than one income stream. And I would say, hey, maybe you want to consider teaching. And some will say, oh, I don't want to teach. I just want to play. And I'd always say, well, man, be good. You make some good investments. But if you only play and perform, when the performance is stopped, unless you made a lot, a lot of money, you know, you want to keep some money coming in. And, and you know, that kind of gets into the business side a little bit because you want to write, compose on the publishing on your music. I would do all of those things. Once somebody asked me one time, they said, why well, close the musicians in New York tell me the work is drying up? And it's not a lot of gigs like it used to be. How's that affecting you? And I said, I hadn't, I hadn't really noticed. And I wasn't being facetious. Mm. I was just saying that, well, if I'm not performing, I'm composing. If I'm not composing, I'm teaching. If I'm not teaching, I'm arranging. And if, you know, That's there's right. always, you know, there's always something to do. And even if you learn how to use music notation software, I've hired a couple, several of my former students that I now, I publish my own music, but I pay them to do to do the music prep. And, um, you know, I know how to use the music notation software, but it's very time consuming. I'd rather write. I still write by hand. And sometimes right. Right. I like raving into the computer, but so the, you know, COVID has affected a lot of work, but it's opened up things that I've gotten a chance to see things that I would never see because I'm always gone. Exactly. Right. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Always a good things come out of the seemingly bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is your new aspiration or goals from here? My new aspiration to goals, I mean, you know, I have musical things that I want to do, but for me right now, I want to see the world at large, and particularly here in the United States, change. COVID is one thing. We can't do anything about the, the pandemic. It has nothing to do with, you know, political policies or anything like that. Everyone is affected by that. But also um, by the other pandemic, which is the systemic racism here that exists against yes. know, African Americans, against it can be Japanese Americans, it, 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 you know, women. I want to see the world um, change the way that music makes people come together. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be in a concert with people that may not, you know, you can enjoy the music and if the music can bring you together, then we can bring ourselves together. So my aspiration is to figure out maybe not to write a song. I'm sure I will. Matter of fact, I have. I wrote something called uh, COVID Blues and, and I was doing it on a performance. I think it was Thursday last week, just a week ago. COVID the, Blues? The, yes, the COVID. I call it the COVID Blues because... That will remind me why I wrote it or when I wrote it. And um, I talk about COVID, but I also talk about that other pandemic. So my aspiration is to do something that I saw Louis Armstrong do and that I've even seen happen in my own lifetime, where music knocks down the barriers that separate us because you look different or because you're a woman or because you're from another country or because you live on this side of town or that side of town. I want to see people come together like they do when the spirit of music brings us together. And it doesn't matter where you're from. I think that everyone wants to be loved. Everyone has love to give and they want to receive it. So why can't we just do that with and for each other without all of this mess? It didn't just start happening. It's been happening <laughs> for hundreds of years. But now people have cameras. 
They have phones. Even when you, when, when people around the world saw the civil rights movement, it people didn't believe when you saw the people getting attacked by dogs and fire hoses turned on them and the police brutalizing people that are peacefully protesting. It's like it hasn't changed. And I want to know when things are going to change. So my aspiration, I think, is to be in some way, shape or form a part of that change or a part of a conversation that will make people realize that you don't have to be this way. And it reminds me of a conversation somebody told me about Louis Armstrong. He was down in Texas, and I think it was a white man that was ready to you know, start some stuff and cause trouble. And he said, you know what? I hate you. And Louis Armstrong disarmed him, and he said, well, okay, that's fine. Why do you hate me? And I nodded. God listened to the question because then he started to think, well, why do I hate him? He had no reason. Wow. To do it. He was talking and say, you know, you're a really nice person. I really love your music. And again, my aspiration to make another record, yeah, that'd be great. To write another song, that would be great. But I probably will, even though it's been hard to do that during this time when I go to the bed with the images in my mind that I see on television. And I'm like, okay, how can we, I know what music does for me. Music saves me. Mm -hmm. Music makes yep. me want to continue to live and just be good and to bring people to, um, you know, what music does. So anyway, I said about 10 times now, but that's, that's kind of what I aspire to. <laughs> I think these people need to listen to more music. I said that often. You know, like there's a 1956 or 57 clip of Louis Armstrong singing Black and Blue by Fast Wallow, which started out as a tune about a woman pining behind her man because her dark-skinned man left her for a woman of a, you know, a lighter hue, skin color, whether she was white, whether she was just light-skinned or whatever. Pops changed the lyrics, and it became a protest song against about racism in the United States. So he's there in Ghana singing this song. There are 100,000 people at this concert and it's 50,000 on each side from the center of the stage, just separated by five or 10 feet, you know, rope. And those people weeks before were at war, killing each other. And now they call the truth and they're attending a concert um, by Louis Armstrong. And I'm sure he did a full concert but to have him sing this song to them, it stopped a war. So sometimes I would joke and say, it'd be nice if anybody's at war just for an airplane or a helicopter to fly over and just drop a big ass boom box down <laughs> and let it be playing jazz or some music to make people put down their guns. And you know, because it's stupid. What are we yeah. fighting for? I hope you enjoyed part one. Please continue to watch part two about songwriting as well. And don't forget to click subscribe and hit the bell to get notified about new videos of Songwriter's Room, my new music, or Japan news series. Arigato!